as we start, I'd just like to ask you all a question. Would you raise your hands if you feel you've arrived at your mission? If you've arrived at your mission. Okay, not many <laughs> hands raised. <laughs> okay. Um, and I wasn't expecting many hands raised. I thought there might have been one or two. Um, but that backs up my, my thought that maybe we often understand mission as something quite monumental, something quite big, solid almost, yes? Like, for example, fighting great battles in the Old Testament, that might have been someone's mission, or um, preaching to big crowds like, Paul or even modern evangelists who we see as yeah they they've reached their calling of going what doing what God wants and going and um, speaking to thousands and leading thousands to baptism maybe or closer to home for me I recently um, attended a sad occasion which was a funeral of a friend who died just a few days before she turned 40 and um, her um, I don't know if he was a boss or supervisor, but a professor from the university where she was a researcher um, had asked, I believe, to say a few words at her funeral. And it was really eye-opening when you just know someone as a friend from church to hear what they're doing. And he said, her research has made a real serious impact in how we understand immunity, how we understand disease, and how we're treating it now. It's changing lives. Her research was about vitamin D. Um, and how it affects immune cells and that it's been groundbreaking um, and I came away from that funeral thinking she'd found her mission she'd found what God had called her to do um, so we can get inspiration from <laughs> learning things about those close to us but while we think of things like that perhaps as mission we often think of just going to the normal nine to five or staying home and looking after the baby or washing the dishes as nothing. We don't often think, this is my mission, do we? <laughs> I've arrived. And sometimes we can be looking forward, looking towards a future. I recently heard someone um, sharing thoughts on um, having felt at one point, when, I'm, when I get married, then I and my spouse will be able to do great things for God together, looking towards that future of when I'll have reached, when it will happen. Or perhaps when my children have grown up and I have time, then I'll be able to volunteer my time to causes for God. Or when I graduate with my medicine degree, then I will have reached where God is calling me to be. Currently, I'm, I'm on the way. I'm en route. However, you might have been able to tell from my tone already, but I would like to suggest that our mission is already and always at hand. Now, this idea came to me um, based on something that, something that occurred to me during a reading challenge that I um, undertook earlier in the year. Um, at the beginning of the year, there was a reading challenge to read through the book Steps to Christ, a chapter a day. And there was a section, I can't remember if that chapter spent um, a long time talking about it or if it just came up in passing, but there was a bit that talked about Jesus's life growing up in the carpenter's shop in Nazareth. And suddenly I realized that in that carpenter's shop, Jesus wasn't waiting for his mission. We certainly think of Jesus's mission as being a three and a half year period when he was aged around 30. That's what he came for, those three and a half years. And when he got there, he'd reached his mission. But it suddenly just clicked. Jesus wasn't hanging around waiting for something to start. He didn't spend... 20 years just twiddling his thumbs and saying while I'm here the important thing's not reached yet let me just find something to occupy myself with while he was in the carpenter's shop that was his mission it wasn't 
dead time, useless time. God didn't overlook in his plan that, well, you've got to be 30 when it happens. So we'll get you. And then, okay, here we go. It starts once you're 30. Jesus was doing what he'd been called to do for those 20 or so years, and he was doing it faithfully. He was called to be there at that time. So the idea that I'm hoping that by the end of this um, short sharing that I'll have transmitted, and that I hope you'll agree <laughs> on the reasoning I'll put forward, but the idea I'd like to put forward is that if you're currently studying to become a doctor, you're not in the process of becoming who God has called you to be. You have been called to be a medical student for now. And so you should give your all into doing that at this moment. See that as your current calling. And I like that illustration of medical student and doctor because it seems to really show the difference between process and arriving and challenging that. I think there's a reason behind it. The reason I wanted to hit home on this point is that I think it affects the way we undertake what we're currently doing. How we see this moment makes a big difference. An athlete in rehearse in training does not put the weight into what they're doing that they put when they're in front of a stadium of thousands of people because they see it as preparation versus this is the moment. But if they saw the training as the moment too, they might try and train differently and even do better when the real time comes. So today I'd like to run through quite a few different examples from the Bible. And the first one is Abraham. And Abraham was called to leave where he grew up and go to Canaan. But God, when he planned and said, leave now, knowing there was no cars, planes, trains, he knew how long it would take. God in his planning didn't just say, well, the journey needs to happen to get there. He will have planned saying, I'll ask him to leave in time to be where I want him to be when he needs to be there. A bit like nowadays, our phones are so smart they can tell you so they can remind you half an hour before you're supposed to go to the appointment god had a plan in that journey and while abraham was traveling it wasn't all about canaan if it was all about canaan god could have told him to make a three-week trip and get there and get on with it but he even told abraham look it's your descendants hundreds of years from now who are eventually going to be here so his plan must have been in the journey it must have been in the people who Abraham would encounter along the way and who he would leave his wells and his altars as a testimony to who'd seen his character and learned something of the God who has called this person on his wandering journey. Abraham's wandering was his mission for most of his life. So if we're on the journey, God hasn't overlooked the journey. God has planned that in. And let's keep our eyes open for what he wants from us in that moment. Acts 17, verse 26, um, talks about this and says, He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So God has a plan. And even if, because of human error, we're currently in plan B, or C, or D, or Q, or Z, God is still in control. And he has something he wants us to do here and now. So considering the next example that links to this idea of what if we don't feel we're where God initially wanted us, we can look at Moses. And when Moses was a shepherd in Midian, he could have looked back on his life and thought, right, I thought now is the time for my mission. Let's do it. And I went through and I tried it and I messed up big time. I hope most know the story of, of what I'm referring to. I know I've been a bit vague with that, but Moses was walking along. He's going to be Prince of Egypt. And he decides to take matters into his own hands to free the Israelites through violence and has to run away and spend 40 years as a shepherd. 
40 years later, you could forgive Moses for thinking, I failed miserably. I missed my chance. I should be there by now. If I'd not messed up, we could have been in Canaan by now, 40 years on. Yeah? He could have thought that, but I got a wake-up call about thinking why now I should be or could be when I read Exodus 12, verses 40 and 41. Because Exodus 12, 40 and 41 says, Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt on the very same day, exactly 430 years after they'd gone in. And I don't think, I think God is a God of symmetry, a God of beauty, and this isn't conducive, this isn't um, something that the Bible has, has explicitly stated, but I see it as one of those things that to me is God's fingerprints that he took them out on the same day and he's chosen to tell us that, that it was exactly 430 years. And it just makes me think, perhaps Moses, your timing, not that that's the way he should have gone about it. He did make a mistake, but perhaps your mistakes weren't so powerful that they could throw all of God's planning out the window after all. The next example in our, in our little fashion show of, um, of people in the Bible who I think illustrate this point is the Shunammite. The Shunammite woman, the lady who Elisha came into contact with. And we find her story in 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, and we'll start with verses 8 to 10. Which says, now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem when there was a, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Something so simple. She wasn't healing. She wasn't preaching. But in offering a place to rest for his servant, she was answering God's call. She was supporting his work by making the work of the preacher, the prophet, easier, giving him that respite. And Jesus says, you didn't do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. She was like Aaron and her holding up Moses' hands, something that seems small. I could hold up someone's hands. <laughs> I mean, it might be harder than you think for hours and hours, but I'm sure I could manage. But it was so, so necessary to the success of God's work, to the success of the cause of good as the prophet's own work. And then we see even Elisha's servant, Gehazi, later on in the story, has his own mission in this time where what he's doing is vital. Um, in verse 29, it says to us, Then he said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And this is a, a little aside, but a point I get from this is the need for us to focus. When we have a mission, small or great, to keep focused on the task at hand. He said, don't even greet anyone. That tells you how urgent he saw this task as. Even if what you're doing doesn't seem so big, it is important. Gehazi was bringing the son to the mother, and there there's a little symbol, perhaps, of what our mission is actually doing, no matter how small it seems. Go and put my stick on a little boy, but he says, do not get distracted and then going back to the Shunammite story herself verse 30 and the mother of the child said as the Lord lives and as your soul lives I will not leave you so he Elisha rose and followed her and 
there's questions I don't have answers for yet in this story. I think it's interesting that she knew that what Elisha has answered isn't enough. He's, he's answered her question, sent the servant with the stick, said, don't let anything distract you. Go and put my staff on the boy. And something tells her, do not let this man out of your sight. The servant isn't enough. You need Elisha right now. But what I see in her response here is faith. She expected something. Her son is dead, yet she's still saying, I will not leave you as my soul lives. She wouldn't have bothered doing that if she didn't expect that God could do something through Elisha. And what else would she be expecting or looking for apart from re restoration? And she believed that he who gave her the son in the first place through this prophet could bring him back. She got her huge miracle from carrying out such a simple mission, such a simple bit of service. That was her mission, and it's recorded in Scripture for us to read for eternity. I'd like to move on next to some people in the New Testament, and we have Lydia. Lydia's story is in Acts, Acts 16, and we start with verses 14 and 15. And we won't spend long at all with her, but we'll read these couple of verses. Acts 16, 14 and 15 says, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Again, hospitality. She believed the message and all she did was say, come and find somewhere to rest, somewhere to stay. And that made a difference to their mission. So much so that in verse 40, something that I think is really interesting happens. Between verse 15 and verse 40, there's quite some events. This is where the apostles are imprisoned. And while they're in prison and singing in prison, <laughs> There's a huge earthquake, the doors break open, the chains fall off all the prisoners, and they all stay there because of the love of Jesus, even those who aren't with the apostles are still there. And when the, um, when the jailer is about to kill himself because he thinks all his prisoners have gone and he's going to lose his life, he can't face judgment, he hears, don't hurt yourself, we're all here. And he and his whole, you know, midnight, a midnight meal for all the prisoners and the jailer himself instead of now tying them up in irons is the one washing their wounds, a baptismal service for the whole family. It's filled with interest and excitement. And what happens was the first place they go after these huge events and this miracle. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. The first place they had to go after all this was, we need to go to Lydia's house. Her mission wasn't small. It can seem small to us, but it made a big impact a big difference and it looks like perhaps that's even where all the believers were to be found god was working great things through the small supposedly small calling he had for her so moving on to our final um final example we have priscilla and aquila husband and wife team their story is found in Acts, verse 18, Acts chapter 18, rather, and we'll, we'll flick through, we'll go to um, verses 1 to 3 to start with, and then 18 and 19, and then move on a bit from there. So to find out who they were, it starts in chat verses 1 and 3, saying, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. So point number one, they're ordinary people. It's just this, you know, a fellow Jew, someone who lived in Italy, and yeah, they've had some unusual things having to move with what was going on politically, but they're just ordinary, an ordinary couple. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation, they were tent makers. Okay, so what was their mission? They were tent makers. I've never heard anyone when they say, what do you want to do for God? Say, I want to make tents. 
that these guys had as their mission to be tent makers. We don't know what, how that benefits the gospel, but we'll see how God used them as he developed them later on. But by now, being tent makers meant that they could be companions to Paul. So that was a secondary mission, to be a friend to the person God's called to what can be a very difficult um, life at times. And so then it continues. So Paul still remained a good while. This is um, now 18 and 19. So we've, we've got to something that happened a bit later. Paul still remained somewhere a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. So now they're accompanying the apostle in his travels. They're his travel companions, supporting him. And then um, we see, I won't read the end of that couple of verses, but we see that Paul's journeys are taking him elsewhere and there's other things going on. And now we get to a point where Priscilla and Aquila are not currently with Paul. We're now on verses 24 to 28. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So now their mission has evolved. Now they're teaching and training, but not like great teachers with a lot of fame and reputation who are being seen and praised for doing great things. They're just pulling aside. They spot some talent. They spot a need for a bit of, you know, a bit of um, additional instruction. They pull him to one side and gently teach him. And perhaps their time with Paul has equipped them better for this point that they're calling right now. And then it goes on to say, and when he, um, this being Apollos still, desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He was doing great things and being of great use to the church because of the skills God had given him in in um, debating, etc., and speaking publicly. But they had had a part in that work through doing their humble mission. They weren't preaching, but they were teaching and training the, the, the preacher. And our mission is not necessarily an event. It's an ongoing, I was going to say story, but lifestyle even. This story really reminds me of Roger Monod's testimony. Um, for anyone who doesn't know of Roger Monod, he was um, very powerful prayer, um, in prayer ministry and reading any of his books just blow you away with how he would pray and amazing things would happen to the point that he was receiving thousands and thousands of letters asking for people to pray with him. And he would start his day praying for hundreds of people and then receive thousands of letters thanking him and telling him all the wonderful things that had happened. And his story was very... Um, very eventful in that he started his path to Christ by getting involved in the occult quite um, and spiritualism and Satan worship quite deeply and quite seriously to the point that he feared for his life when he wanted to come out. And he met a co-worker who um, happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist and start, when he noticed the connection, he said to him one day at work, tonight I'm coming to your house and I need you to give me a Bible study and tell me more about this to the point where he stayed at their house all night, demanding one study after another, this man and his wife, because he was saying, I can't leave this house until I have the power of God and I know that I'm going to be safe. And it, it sounds very interesting. He was there chain smoking in their kitchen and this poor couple, well, like, they didn't say anything. They didn't complain. They just said, okay, he really, really, really wants another Bible study. It's getting quite late, but okay. And one day he was at a big Adventist event being interviewed by Pastor Doug Batchelor and telling his story. And that couple were sitting in the front two seats and they kind of put the mic towards them and thanked them for their mission and said, he's here because of that 
seemingly small thing that you did and it's affected so many people. So that's who I think of when I see Priscilla and Aquila taking young Apollos aside. And there's a verse later, it's going to mention somebody else, but it's also talking about Priscilla and Aquila and what Paul had to say about them. And this is in Romans 6, verses 1 to 4. But this is, I first preached this sermon in Spanish, so I put everything from the Spanish, and I was disappointed with how some of the English verses are phrased. Um, I'll explain why on this one. And this is a quick plug for something I found out about recently. It's not an Adventist initiative, but it's a Christian initiative by somebody who's got a background in translator. It's called TIPS. And if anyone's interested, I'll try and find out what that stands for so you can find the website. But the idea is that not just getting insight from looking at what the original language is said in the Bible, but also getting insights in how other languages have translated them. So they've got a database of how verses are written in lots of different languages that can teach us a lot and give us a lot of spiritual insights. So this one, it says in English, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Kenkvea. And that's where I took issue with the translation because the, the one in Spanish says diaconesa, which we might recognize as deaconess which illustrated a bit better what I wanted to say next. Um, but it's the same thing, a servant of the church, someone who helps in the practical things, which now in an official role would call the deaconess, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and myself also. Again, the Spanish said she's been a great help to me. And do we give deacons and deaconesses the recognition they deserve? We need to be content and proud of our calling, whatever God has called us to. Paul's here recommending saints. She's been a huge help in the gospel work so that we will then do everything to the best of our ability because God gives different roles, but he doesn't see them as greater or lesser. And then this is the bit that relates to Priscilla and Aquila. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Um, risk their own necks is a very nice English translation, so perhaps I should give the kudos where it's due as well as just complaining <laughs> um, that the wording didn't serve my purposes. But we can do great things when we faithfully fulfill our little humble calling, whatever it may be. And I thought it interesting that Paul goes on to give such high praise of Priscilla and Aquila who from what we've seen did nothing that maybe the world would consider amazing so I love that section as far as we know they weren't with Paul and doing the same thing in, as him in all of his great exploits for the Lord but in being faithful to whatever came to their hand both Paul and Jesus himself considered them his co-workers part of his team doing the same thing as him do we want that title fellow workers in Christ do we want to deserve that title we didn't consider him as one of our examples but Paul says something similar as we close now about another friend who accompanied him at times and that's in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 10 and 11 he says and if Timothy comes See that he may be without, with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. As I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Sorry, one more difference with the Spanish. The Spanish said I have great need of him. Sorry. <laughs> he needed Timothy. Our contribution makes a difference. There's a poem or a little rhyme that says, for the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. Does anyone know it? For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost about a, balance, uh, a battle and they couldn't use the horseshoe because there was a nail missing. For the want of the nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of the shoe, the rider was lost. For the want of the rider, the battle was lost. For the want of the battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Maybe you're called to be a nail. 
So be a nail, and by the grace of God, be the best, strongest, most durable nail the kingdom of darkness has ever reckoned with, and you could be the straw that wins the battle. This quiet quote from Ellen White, I feel like I've kind of tricked you in a way because I could have just read this quote from Ellen White and that would have been the sermon <laughs> um, because it sums up perfectly what I've been trying to say and possibly not as succinctly, but this says it about the greatest of all our examples, Jesus Christ himself. And it's taken from um, Steps to Christ. Um, 81, 3, and 4. And it says, We do not need to go to heathen lands or even leave the narrow circle of the home if it is there that our duty lies in order to work for Christ. We can do this in the home circle, in the church, among those with whom we associate and with whom we do business. The greater part of our Saviour's life on earth was spent in patient toil in the carpenter's shop at Nazareth. Ministering angels attended the Lord of life as he walked side by side with peasants and laborers. Unrecognized and unhonored, he was as faithfully fulfilling his mission while working at his humble trade as when he healed the sick or walked upon the storm-tossed waves of Galilee. So in the humblest duties and lowliest positions of life, we may walk and work with Jesus. So if you're a medicine student, a businessman, a housewife, if you're a cleaner, or maybe the role, your role is helping count the offerings on a Sabbath, leading the pathfinders or driving the mini, minibus, or being a friend to the evangelist and offering him your home for somewhere to stay. If this is your mission to prepare you for another, or if your current mission is your lifelong calling, your mission is here and your mission is now. May we fulfill our missions with all our strength and always remember what God tells us in our scripture reading. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. May God help us.